Hey everybody, welcome back to another Stoneface Reaction. I'm Griffin, that's Theta, and we're going over basically the end of Iron Blood Orphans Season 1, where we're going to take a look at our favorite characters and our favorite episodes, and basically just have a little bit of fun with it as a kind of wrap-up to the season. Yeah, I figured we'd do a little uh, tier maker of the uh, of the characters, and we'll just go down a little like uh, top five of our favorite uh, episodes, which you know... I know, everyone out there is thinking, Mustache Guy, he must have, like, none. None from one to zero. Uh, little do you realize, Theta is great at putting things he doesn't like in order, so he still has his tops of everything he hates. Right. So I figure we'll start off here with the uh, tier list. And as we can see, right down here, I don't know if I'm capturing cursor or not. Yep, yep. We have uh, Almeria Baldwin. Ah, yes, the little girl who's about to be wed to our uh, soon-to-be main antagonist, I believe. Or to McGillis, more accurately. Oh, yeah, I consider him an antagonist now. <laughs> so, where do we rate this character? She is absolutely adorable, right? Yes. And but, I... But, you know, you go ahead, and then I'll give my stupid, stupid reasons where I would put her. Right. She She is absolutely adorable, but while she serves a purpose she doesn't do very much she she exists much like some of the other children who are kind of on the sideline she's not a main active character but she's she's great to see on screen like i would put her solidly b just because i have more fun seeing her than not seeing her i think the thing we should do here is that if one of us ranks them high then the degree lower that the other person ranks them at should be the number of spaces they get drank, dragged down. Do you think that's agreeable? Uh, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Because Average I would put her in A for a dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she is in like four to five episodes where she does cute shit and then she cries because people are making fun of her. And mm -hmm. uh, McGillis says that he'll protect her from all of that. And I mean, she is a, like, yeah. basically she's a political pawn. So... I say A, you say B, that's one difference, so she gets dragged down from A to B anyway. There you go. Uh, so next maybe up, there'll be more of her in Season 2. Yeah. Next up down here, we have Arca. I do believe that is the main wife, isn't it? Isn't she? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think she's got some good screen presence, but uh, like many of the side characters, she doesn't have like a whole lot of time. I, I do think she has a good personality, though. And she also, I believe, pilots one of the mechs as well, doesn't she? Yep, I uh, pointed out the bright pink one. Because she's a lady. I don't know why. <laughs> They're all ladies on that ship. So where would you rank it? You go first on this one. Well, you know me. I put her as A. <laughs> one, she <laughs> is a strong, independent woman that goes out and fights and holds her own in the midst of those fights. She has a leading personality, which... Among the two ships the series had for the majority of it, she, I mean, she basically uh, pushes Naze around whenever he does <laughs> things that she feels is inappropriate and otherwise tells everyone what their relationship is. She, she, she's, she's the conscience then. So for me, she's A tier. I, I think I agree on A tier. She has a purpose, she serves it very well, and benefits the series. All right, A tier it is. Next up is Ozzy. Ozzy. So that is a very uh, small picture right there. <clears throat> what, what do we actually got there? Can you like drag them just up on screen onto the tier list? Uh, it would be the same amount of picture. <laughs> uh, oh, she's gosh. the one in the most recent episode that we watched that you thought might have been dead. Right, right. I believe she's the very grumpy one, isn't she? She's the very tomboyish of the, uh, of the main acting... Uh, air quotes, wives of that group. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, that, that wins points in my favor, like, every time. But uh, while, while our uh, first character here uh, had a lot to do, I don't think she did a whole lot. I think maybe she interacted with some of the other secondary casts who were piloting mechs, but I don't remember any of those interactions. Well, where would you put her, since you're on first this time? I think I would probably put her at C, not because she's bad, but because I'm not sure things would be different if she wasn't there. 
Well, actually, what she does is she gives a lot of advice to uh, specifically guy. I can't remember his name now. The one who's piloting former Crank's mech. Right, right. Uh, Crank's former mech is normal. People would have said that. Um, she gives advice. She's typically there giving advice to the other girls uh, that are also watching that dude practice all the time. So she's very much a uh, matron role when it comes to the uh, the three primary Gundam pilots from that group. I would have put her at B tier, but we both know that means now she gets dragged down to C tier anyway. Yeah. And here everyone's just like, oh no, Theta's the negative one. No, it was me all along. <laughs> it was me, Dio. Uh, all, right. all right. Can you guess who the next one is? Uh, Not with half a portrait. You gotta scroll down at least a teeny little bit for me real quick. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, is that Eugene? Head. It's not Eugene. It was oh, the other one. so close. Who told us to never forget his name, and we don't know. <laughs> who is he? Chad. Chad Chadden. Chad. Chad Chaddington. No, Chad Chadden. That's what I've got as his name. <laughs> Chad Chadden is his actual name. I guess if you got to choose your last name, you may as well make it Chad. So, um... I don't remember what he actually does. After he, like, announces his name in the one outro... I think we were kind of on the lookout for him, and then I don't remember ever seeing him again, partially because he was stuck in space forever after that. For, like, the next seven episodes, he's just not there. I guess I technically go first on this one. Yeah. So, for Chad, I would put him at C-tier, because he had a voice, he had a voice line, he introduced himself to us, there are characters that we've seen who did less. Yeah, I think I would agree. If Chad has a death scene, I would at least comment and, like, slightly care. I would put it at C. He at least exists. I can't wait for somebody to come back in this video later and say, he did die, you didn't notice. <laughs> uh, that would happen. Alright, next up we have Tangunso. Tangunso right. You got I can't, ever, can't pronounce his name, and yeah. I've got it expanded off the two lines. A very traditional Japanese old man who never really tells you that you suck, but he'll constantly voice his disapprovement in very polite ways. <laughs> so, uh, he is actually an important and critical character. Uh, we don't get a whole lot explained about him, though, do we? We, we understand who he is, what he's after, what he wants, and what he's like, but I, I don't think we understand how he got to that position he was in. Well, he's the former prime minister, so I think it can be assumed that he was once prime minister. And I think we all understand how a prime minister gets uh, to that position, since we just saw the whole fight for an election for prime minister. I think you have you to really in, in at the last second, yeah. You have to really infer <laughs> his background because one, he tells you it, and two, he tells you it. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think he is a critical character, and if I have to put my vote on it first, I would probably say I would put him up in A. The story would be radically different if he was a worse character. I would probably start hating the series if he was a terrible character. I would put him at B tier. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I would put him at C tier, but I think that's going to make him go down to B tier anyway. Yeah. Uh, because... In the grand scheme of things, he's a plot device and a mechanism for change, which is exactly where we put another plot device slash mechanism for change. Yeah, that that's pretty fair. So he'll end up in B tier here, along with the, the rest of the ancillary political cast. All right, next up is, can you name which sister that is? Uh... Gosh, that's that's one of the two. I know one of them's named Cookie, I think. And what's the other one named? That's what I'm asking you. Which I want to say Ice Cream just because I'm trying to go as sweet and saccharine as possible, but that's not true. So are you so. saying that this here is uh, Ice Cream? Uh, sure. <laughs> You're wrong. That's Cookie. Ah, no, I was terribly wrong. And what's what's the other one called? Cracker. Cracker. Cookie and Cracker. Ah, that was so yeah. obvious. Sisters to Biscuit. Alright, uh, positively adorable. Uh, I don't think they push anything, but they do... They're, they're there for Biscuit, right? They're there to enforce our love of Biscuit through our love of them. 
and they do it perfectly. They they win my heart. I want more of them, and we're going to go back to Mars, and I want to just see them be adorable, uh, and then probably break down and cry. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna put I'm gonna put Cookie at S. Cookie at S. Yes, the best character. I find them extremely <laughs> adorable, but at the same time, the only effect they have on the story is standing in front of a car, so that our main characters meet McGillis and uh, <laughs> Go Go Dancer. I can't remember his name. Uh, golly, golly! There you go. Go Go Boo Boo. <laughs> go Go. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I would put them at C just for adorable factor alone. You know, I'll, I'll say B for adorable factor alone, but they only have one real effect on the story. Granted, it is a major effect that they meet those two characters because of it, but... Mm -hmm. So I guess that puts them in A tier. Uh, I think it would. And I suppose at the same time we should just go ahead and pull Cracker up there because they honestly come as a pair, right? Basically. <clears throat> if we get a season two episode where they're separated and we spend an extended amount of time with one of them, you know, there we go. All right. Uh, next up we have Conrad. Conrad. He was the uh, early admiral, wasn't he? The one over Mars who was very angry? He uh, instigated our early confusion of what's the difference between the blue suits and the red suits. Ah, yes, that's right. He he did have a role as the early antagonist. He got a lot of stuff going. And I think as a villain, we can genuinely say we don't like him as a person. But I think as a character, he did exactly what he needed to. Well, he was also um, our only insight into how the Martian Rebellion has been quelled, which is to say he sent down military forces, and that's when we saw all the people in bikinis on the streets for some reason. Right, he he's the one responsible for all the suppression uh, pre, pre, uh, pre-show. Or at least I think that's the implication. So, uh, you get to raid him first. Where would you put him? <laughs> God, he had an effect, uh, but really he only had an effect for like two episodes. Three episodes, I think, actually. Uh, I'm going to go B tier. He's very middle of the road. I think I would go with B tier as well. I think he does exactly what he needs to. All right, next up is Crank. Hey, Crank. I mean, that's like an easy S tier right there, right? I mean, He's... even though he only gets two episodes, he does motivate at least one to two other characters for the entirety of the first season. Right. He's a great motivator. He's got a cool design, I think. He's uh, got a great personality. He's very endearing. He's got a good sense of honor, which we see like throughout a lot of the Gallarhorn characters. And it's like the start of like that entire uh, we like Gallarhorn kind of thing, right? Well, at least I uh... am. I too. And he's very immediately points out, wait a second, we're fighting children. This is crazy. I'm going to do the best thing I can to make this not a terrible, immoral thing. I'll fight just one of them. And he, he does lose, unfortunately. Uh, but I think he's a great character. I put him at S. I mean, we both know I was going to put him at S, so... Yeah, he's he is hands down one of our favorites, and we just agree on that. <laughs> It's a shame he didn't last as long as he should have. Mm hmm. All right. Who is next on the dock? All right. Who do you think this is? Uh, well, everything's a little blurry right now. So, uh, I'm a guess. Who's that Pokemon? Uh, Eric. <laughs> Dante. That is Dante. Dante. Uh, there we go. All right. I have no idea who Dante is. Well, I guess <laughs> I actually go first. So, I'm going to say. Yeah, he's one of those guys who we don't really know anything about to possibly appeared on screen a couple of times. But uh, yeah, this is the entire reason that D tier exists. Right. I don't remember a single thing about him. He's probably on the bridge crew. He probably hung out with Eugene. Eugene will have a higher score than this person will. This guy gets a D. Arguably, everybody that was on the bridge introduced themselves, so... He could just have never existed. But D tier for Dante. D for Dante. Who's this Pokemon? Uh, it's so blurry right now for me. <laughs> it's... 
you got to tell me. I can't. There's no way I can guess off of uniform. I can tell he's decadent, but that's it. Sturma. Sturma. Derma. Derma. Who's a derma? <laughs> you got you to help me out here. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, my God. Another one has appeared a number of times. <laughs> but, but when? What, what did they do? What did I tell you? What did I literally just say, Griffin? I already forgot. Is Don't, he I, I, hear, I hear the click clacking in the background. You better not be looking people up. Uh, no, no, I, I, I swear I'm not. No, I'm not cheating on this test. I never would. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to put him in D tier unless you have an overriding opinion about who this person is. I have is. no overriding opinion. This character just washes right off of me. <laughs> Nothing happened with him. All right, next up we have Dexter. Dexter. I don't remember the name. The Accountant. Oh! Oh, the accountant. Yeah, I think I think he was a fun character. He didn't. He only showed up like when he needed to, and I assume he basically just left afterwards because he's definitely not on the ship. I'm pretty sure, right? As far as I know, he never left Mars. Right. So either he's back on Mars handling stuff there, or he left after he helped split the money. Which... Or he went to the uh, the tech uh, the Tewas base. I can't remember if he was there or not. Either way, he never made the full trip to Earth, as far as I can recall. Right, right. He he made sure people got paid out, that they were happy, and basically helped negotiations. I, I think I enjoyed his amount of screen time, and he did what he needed to. I would put him in B tier. I think he existed for what he needed to, and uh, I enjoyed him being on scene. I'm fine with B tier. He had a major impact in that he... Gave the crew all the money they needed that was in the stores, which allowed them to buy a ship, which then got them to Earth and everywhere else. Yeah. There you go. So, hey, all of our plot critical things are ending up in B, huh? So who do you think this is? Uh, It is a Gallerhorn uniform. It's got a bunch of yellow on it. Uh, So they gotta be important, right? There's only a few people that wore a uniform like that. In fact, as far um, as I can recall, there's only two people that wear a uniform like that. Uh, is it Golly Golly? No. Dang. Remember, they had a blue uniform. I want to oh. point out, there's only... We've already done one of the people that wore a uniform like is, this. Is it actually Ian? Who the hell is Ian? The guy in the cybermech at the end. You mean Ein? Ein, yeah, there you go. Ian. Is it? Yes, that's Ian. I mean Ein. <laughs> it's Ayn. There you go. Uh, I genuinely like Ayn. I think he like has a lot of care throughout the entire thing. He, Crank is the one that motivates him, and he becomes the one to follow through on that motivation. I think he's got a lot going for him. He gets sidelined once he gets murdered until he becomes cybernetic. Uh, but at the very end, he gets like a little bit of a... Um, a little bit of a requiem for Ayn, uh, as he gets to fight the main character one on one in a full mech and almost wins until some craziness happens with Barbatos. So I'm gonna put him at S. I think he's a great person. Oh, like you say, he gets sidelined when he gets murdered. You mean in the end of the 25th episode? The last... no, I meant I meant whenever he like takes his massive injuries. Let's say because he otherwise is around. I mean, he's around but not present for basically right. the entire first season. Right. I mean, like, the second half where he's, like, in terrible injuries. But there I mean, obviously, year. I'm not going to argue. He's among the uh, top two of the Gallarhorn, so I'm not going to argue about putting him in S tier. I love the look of this so far, where everyone on Tekadin is in the C and D. But Tekadin has a lot of basically nameless people. We we should just put random Gallarhorn grunt and say like, oh yeah, basic Gallarhorn grunt A tier. <laughs> okay, you should be able to name who this is, and you should, the reason why you should be able to name who this is because I'm telling you, you should be able to name who this is, which is that the... that's got to be Eugene. There you go. That was the there big old go. hint. Yeah, he's he's very very cropped small here for me, but I can tell that's Eugene. 
So, uh, I think Eugene, out of, like, all the bridge crew characters who, like, get their name late, uh, he does something, he gets a noticeable personality, he appears quite a lot towards the second half, and he comes in at the finale and just says, like, hey, I'm the Calvary, I'm here. I, I don't know how he got to the planet, but he did somehow. Uh, I think, I think I would give him a good A tier here. Uh, yeah, that's I, what I was thinking. He's basically a secondary, more fun orca. In that he, he has command of a second ship with its own crew. He pushes himself to that point where he was bleeding from the eye and nose. He mm -hmm. he shows up with the cavalry, as you said. He is just basically a more fun orca. Yeah, he's crazy, he's fun. He literally dragged himself out of obscurity uh, and won our hearts over. Alright, name the next one. Uh, I don't remember their name, but they are Kudelia's secretary, and you, ultimately spy and everything. You don't remember Fumitan? They had a Fumitan. whole episode named after them. Look, I don't even remember my name. Who are you again? <laughs> uh, but yeah, Fumitan, I think um, early on, she's basically just quiet and in the background, but she kind of grows with scene after scene. And they do, like, really hustle in the last episode where she she dies to a sniper. But I th think I would say she's a good character. I think it's interesting to follow her around, what she thinks, and how she, like, kind of slowly grows from, like, all right, I'm a spy, I fucking hate you, I'm doing my job, get the fuck out of here. And eventually grows into, it's like, no, actually, I do think Kudeli is cool enough to take a bullet for. I I think she had an interesting character arc, and I would put her at least at A. All right, well, you know she's going to wind up at B tier then, because I was going to put her at C. Oh, Unfortunately, we had her yeah. number from the first moment we saw her, where we guessed <laughs> that woman is a spy. We thought for a while that maybe we were just wrong. Turns out she was a spy in the end anyways. It's the only interesting episode that she actually had was the one that she died in, so I don't feel like she was all that... I mean, she had a lot of build-up episodes where, like, oh, the crew loves her, we want hugs from Fumitan and candy, she gives us candy. Otherwise, she was a nothing. So, mm -hmm. our desperate opinions of her puts her in B tier, the difference between the two. Right. Which, again, puts her with all the other plot critical characters i think it was important for kudelia so it fits uh All right. so this one this one doesn't have a head i'm gonna say is that mcgillis you were so close there was only really two you could have guessed you guessed the wrong one ah dang it okay well it's, it wasn't mcgillis it's, it's galio it's galio golly golly uh so Damn, I just want to give him a straight up S tier, honestly. Like the final episode where he's he had his essentially sister die in his arms and then has to fight his brother and he's torn up about it, all of it. Uh, I I feel for him. I think he had a great character. Everything about it is tragic. And we followed him from like the very beginning, where he's just like this kind of nice, inquisitive character. He's kind of gets uh, a little bit of an attitude as he's being shown up by these kids, which I, I can totally understand that right there. And eventually comes to this tragic end. I think it was great. I loved his art. So I'm I giving mean, him an S. Also going to go S tier, but I mean, I'm going to reiterate you. <laughs> tragically misunderstood his and Carter's relationship is more of a love interest thing. They aren't siblings. <laughs> They're from two different families. One family is just taking care of the other one. Mm -hmm. Also, that's uh, why he was incredibly teared up and broken up that she was saying McGillis's name because he had the attraction for her, but she never recognized him. Right, right. But yeah. Unrequited love, essentially, too. But, but yeah, yeah. S-tier for me as well. Lots of fun, complicated things there. And, oh, look at that. Gal Galar and <laughs> S-tier. Because <laughs> they're the more interesting characters. Iron-blooded Galar Horn. God, I would love if the next season was actually just the same show, but from the Galar Horn side. Just, like... <laughs> <laughs> this time, this time it was like seventy-five percent uh, Tekken, twenty-five percent Galarhorn, and the next season it's just seventy-five percent Galarhorn, twenty-five percent Tekken. Tekken is just literally taking the slow boat back to Mars. <laughs> uh, 
So, uh, so this has gone incredibly blurry on me. I can see some purple hair, but I don't remember any names because I'm stupid. <laughs> Hold on. Oh my gosh, yeah. you got worse. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have any options to increase whatever you're seeing. Oh, I know. It just fades in and out. You gotta save me. Who, who, who's this Pokemon? Haba. Haba. I'm racking my brain. Does it? There's gonna come be to characters me? we don't remember, which means she, why D tier exists. She, she's gotta be one of the Tewaz people, right? She's gotta be somebody from Mars. You, really, from Mars? There's nobody on the Tewa side that dresses like that. People on Mars dress like that. All the flashbacks and everything we see. That's got to be a Mars person. But who's she related to? What does what she serve? Uh, she know. probably works somewhere. Is she the one shop who owner, runs the I would cactus assume. shop? I would assume. She runs the cactus shop, I guess. Uh... In that case, I I would still go with D tier. She's not involved in the story, as far as I remember. Oh, that's a shame because I was going to put her in C tier, but the fact that you put her in D tier <laughs> drags her down to D tier. Uh, you might remember that she eventually is the one that saves one of our main characters after they are starving in the streets, and uh, the psychopath says that they need food. Oh, okay. So she she had like a very bit role, but that's mm. she she's backstory. All right, next up is Hyeda. Hyeda, is isn't that the other mech pilot on the Tekuden team? The second one, I think. No. Second. No. No. Sorry, no. I had to even increase the picture on my side to double check. Nope. Nope. I, I gotta see this guy's face. Let's see his face. Uh, hold on, let me... Oh, gosh. Uh, Tear Maker. Tear Maker really does it, huh? There was no way, even with a portrait set up, that I could... Uh... Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I feel ya. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Where are, is this folder? <laughs> Wish I could just drag it over, but I can't. You can just drag it into D tier real quick for us to look at it. No, it doesn't. Again, I have to reiterate, it does not increase the size of the picture, despite how oh. much you think it does. Oh, wait. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I see it now. Oh. So, uh, what did he do? Who, who's, he, whose side is he on, actually? He's, he's Gallarhorn, isn't he, actually? I don't know. Oh gosh, we just don't remember characters. Was he like one of Crank's dudes? He just bites the dust episode two. <laughs> I'm just saying I don't remember Here this, we go. This this genuinely calls for like a, a Google search. <laughs> nope, that's cheating. Ah oh, no, we just got a run off of memory. So Hakido Yeah, I just don't remember him. <laughs> there we go. There's a larger version of the image for you. Oh, wait, no. He's from, like, the early episodes, isn't he? Could he's be. The, uh, he's the initial uh, combat leader for the Mercenary Company, isn't he? Could be. Yeah, he's the one who beats the kids and everything. <laughs> and sends them off to die because he you can't. might recognize he has the same uniform as the accountant, which would uh, lean into that theory. Oh my gosh, he's an asshole. That's great. He goes, he's risen up already. Now that I remember him, he, uh, he definitely serves a purpose. He does it well. He disappears afterwards. Or no, I think he literally gets shot in the head, doesn't he? Most of them do. Yeah, there you go. Although not all uh, of them do. I think he is some of the ones that one of the ones that does get shot in the head. He has to very rapidly set up the stakes for everyone, set up an antagonist for the heroes to overcome, so the heroes look good in comparison. And he actually does that. I would give him up to A tier, I think. I think he serves his purpose incredibly well. For the part of one episode that he's in. Yes. 
because I would give him C tier because he's barely even a motivating factor. I feel like Orca would have done taken over anything he was already in anyway. Mm-hmm. So I guess that moves him to B tier. Back to all the other plot essentials, which that's perfectly fine. All right. Next up, we have Henry. 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 Gosh, everything went blurry again, and I could have swore that was a female character. Could be. Could be a female character named Henry. <laughs> <laughs> who, who is this person? Where do where do we see them? Because I need to play twenty questions with you. I mean, on there's this. the bigger character. There's the bigger image. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, it's her. Yeah, it's the one with the wig. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Henry's short for Henrietta. Probably. So she definitely plays a role. I don't think she moves anything, but she is basically the face of our political antagonist on the Gallerhorn side, uh, McGillis's father. So she's kind of a hench person here. Uh, but did we ever learn anything about her? Only uh, where she sat in the mechanization, uh, the mechanations of, uh, sorry, the machinations of that character. Right, right. She she serves a purpose, but she doesn't do anything. She didn't move the plot forward. I would put her at C tier. I think she's interesting, but we don't get anything out of her this season. I can agree with that. She's important, but not directly so all right now we have a confusing uniform that is also blurred aston aston uh whose side third party the... i guess third party was that then... the pirates actually was that the brother uh, i believe it might be i couldn't say for certain oh my gosh it's the brother yeah within like the space of two episodes they had to very quickly characterize him and his sudden depression at finding his brother again uh i i think maybe there's like a little bit of uh weak justification for him going crazy uh but they do want to like ramp up the tragedy and give their side characters some personality i would I would put him solidly into B tier, I think. he He's there for somebody else. Well, I'm going to have to apologize to you, Griff, because I'm going to be dragging him down to C tier, because I would put him in C tier, no. and that's going to drag him down. I already stated how unappetizing his story was due to how fast they had to spit it all out, plus the fact we got him in two episodes and basically saw the same flashback twice. Mm-hmm. All right, who's that Pokemon? All right, I I want to say Mikazuki, but it's so green and pixelated right now. But I can see Mikazuki is actually down the line. Is he the one with his arm raised there? I I think that has to be Mikazuki then. No, this is Donji. Donji. Also goes by Henry. Henry. It uh uh, uh my brain's broken. Save me. <laughs> can't. You can't? You don't know either? Look, I don't know most of the decadent people because they're nameless people who exist only to die off screen. Oh, God. Also, they're clearly not my favorites. So I am the Gallarhorn side. Is this one of the kids? If it's decadent, clearly it has to be one of the kids. Uh, uh, of course, they're all kids. But I mean, it's one of the younger kids. Because I'm. Man, I just don't know on this one. I, I have to go with, I don't remember them at all. So I'm just going to put them over here then. You don't either. If we can't remember them, then they're D-tier. <laughs> D-tier is the automatic place for uh, people who have no the nameless few. Yeah, they're no Eugene. Or Chad. <laughs> Alright, so who is this? I, it is... You have to tell me who this is. It's Ario. Azario. Don't remember the name. That looks like a Gallarhorn uniform. Well, you know who it is. You literally just saw him. Wait, did I? Mm-hmm. My, my brain. His son uh, was just telling him off. Oh, oh, he's he's the leader. He's McGillis' father, right? 
Well, the sharing the last name bit probably says yes. There we go. Okay, okay. So that's all clear. Uh, he kind of pops up a little late as, like, the true and anti-anti-antagonist, I guess. He shows up in, like, episode two and three. Yeah, he shows up very early. He pops up. He He's always in the background, but he does he does have a lot of purpose here. He doesn't do anything immediately because he's already won. Well, like, I mean, this is supposed to be his, like, final stroke here, just, like, getting elected, right? He's commanding Galileo and, um... McGillis in the early episodes telling them what to do. So he's like very much in the foreground. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I, I always assumed that McGillis and uh were were doing it like on their own impetus kind of more than anything. But I guess it does make sense that they had orders from somewhere. No, when we see them on Earth in that giant room that you complain about all the time, that's the guy behind the desk. Yeah, the huge ass empty room with absolutely no decorations and just a single desk. Uh, I hate that room. I hate it so He's much. He's the guy that's been behind the desk every time, and that's it's why... like a basic ass quake mod room. It's just like, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna make it really big, and I'm gonna put one object in it. That's what this room. And that's is. why when we see him at the very last episode, he's back in that room again. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would put him in S tier. He he is focal to this story. He's the person everyone is trying to beat for different reasons. Ooh, I would put him at C tier actually. Ah, so why would you put him lower? What do you think? Because he is focal, but he's focal from a background perspective. Like none of his machinations actually work out. They're so long term and untouched. So that they're, only... they're very abstract in the sense of us as viewers. So that only actually McGillis acting against it has any effect on the story. And then that puts the onus of uh, importance on McGillis and not this guy, actually. So I believe that would put him back to B tier then, wouldn't it? As the middle ground? I actually didn't know, because in fact it's between A and B. So you lean uh, harder but... into A or you lean harder into B? Uh, let's let's go with B tier here then as the compromise. He is he is plot essential. He goes with all the other plot essential characters. All right. I uh, believe you know who the next one is. Uh, Rolina Peacecraft. Yeah, how could I ever forget? No, it's Kudelia. And I have to say, I think I genuinely like Kudelia as a character. I think uh, so. A lot of the times, there's like usually a Gundam princess. Uh, technical term there, not literal. Uh, and sometimes they come across as, like, whiny, or maybe they don't do anything, or they're just backgrounds, or they're there to be rescued by the hero, or they're only a love interest. She, she like, very, like, toes the love interest line, but nothing comes of it, because Mikazuki can't feel anything, because he's not a human being. Um, but Kudelia has a purpose, she cares about it, she goes through arcs, she has, like, uh, questions about herself, and she overcomes them, she has confidence. She's obviously not, like, a fighter or a soldier. I think I, like, uh, joked earlier that if she, like, she started picking up a gun and shooting people, I'd be like, hell yeah. Uh, she didn't, but she still won me over. I think she is a good, well-written character with lots of interesting things going on. I'm giving her S tier. I have the temptation to put her in A tier. Ooh. Well, because a lot of the time, not a lot of the time, I want to say half of the episodes is leading up to her becoming that character you just described. The other half is her figuring out that she wants to be that character. And another character had to die for her to actually become that person. Mm -hmm. So it kind of feels like she's just a step behind S tier. All, all I will say is that I remember both of us being absolutely incredibly excited at the end of an episode where she's about to give a speech and then they cut us off of her to end the episode. Right, which means she failed. She failed to ex <laughs> meet expectations. Which no, is... she gets the she gets the uh, speech next episode, but we get completely cut off. <laughs> Right, she blue balled us, which is what an A tier yeah. person would do, and not an S tier person. That's what the writers did, not the character. I think but... you'll find that the writers also wrote the character. Yeah, but uh, here we are. We have our rankings. Let's put her on the board. Yeah, as I said, I haven't decided yet between A tier. Oh, and I... you, you, oh, you still have to actually decide. I thought you were just gonna go for A. That's what I'm saying. I, I kind of feel like she should be an S tier, though. 
despite my misgivings, so I guess I'll side with you on S. Making her the first non-Gallarhorn in S tier. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Lauder. Lofter. Uh, I believe this is one of the Tewaz characters, one of the other mech pilots, the duo of mech pilots, I think. Yeah. Or is she one of the bridge bunnies? Well, I think she's also on the bridge, but she's also a uh, a pilot. I believe she... she's probably the one who was painting her nails a lot early on. Mm-hmm floating around in her mech. And she also spends a lot of time watching the other guy train. Right, right. She, She's very much like an eye candy character in that, like, that's how someone built the mold of her. I don't think she, like, really breaks out of that, but, like, instead of being, like, annoying or detriment, I think she, she serves a purpose. She, she exists as a character who's happy to be there, and she's a little entertaining to be on screen. I don't think she's bad. Uh, and she fills out the rest of the Tewaz crew. I would put her at B. Well, you're the one dragging down now, because I was going to put her at A. If you oh, recall, really she like did her. fight, um, uh, she did fight Mikazuki to a standstill. Ooh. Over the I course of an episode that. and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's quite skilled, and then she does back them up on Earth. But mm -hmm. yeah, so I was going to put her at A, you put her at B, which means she goes to B. Yeah. If she had... If I thought she was more story critical, I'd put her into A, I think. All right. uh, but next we have someone who is a little fat and has a tie. Can you guess? Uh, you know, there's only one chubby character per series, but I see Hitler all the way down there on the page, so can't Actually, we have multiple chubby characters in the series. You clearly don't remember a bunch of them. Right, and I see Biscuit like slightly down the line. I'm waiting on him. So who who could who could this guy be? Maruba. Maruba. I definitely remember hearing that name, and I'm trying to remember what is that Biscuit's brother? Nope. No. Okay. No, he's he's thinner, isn't he? This is yeah. an early series character. Don't look it up. Oh, I'm not looking it up. I'm just making sure I answer people. Um, Maruba, Maruba, Maruba. Is he actually one of the Dort guys? Nope. No. Oh, damn. Okay, so this is narrowing really fast. He really coins one of the phrases we use throughout the entire series. Wait, what's the phrase? Space rat. So when did that happen? So it it can't be one of the original mercenaries then, I think. It's not Dord, so we're like looking in between those two periods. I don't think he's a pirate because he's too well. Oh no, he is the commander. He's the original commander of the mercenary group. Well, owner anyway. Owner, you're, yes. Uh, so yeah, he does that. He's there, he makes off with the safe, he goes into space and he gets captured. No, oh, man. no, he doesn't get captured. He he shows up on the Tewa ship because he, I guess, hired them to capture yes. the rest of the crew. Yep, yep. And and then Orca gets to the bridge and uh, Tewa's captain is just like, yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, he he's definitely a slimy character and it was fun seeing him get his comeuppance. I would... Uh... And I think it was actually very important to the series for that to happen, to actually like get the full closure for the group. I would put him at A. It was a critical point for him to be terrible and for the characters to say that we are less terrible than you. Well, unfortunately, we're going to drag him down to B again, because I would put him at B. Mm -hmm. because... Plot critical again. Yeah, plot critical, but not important to the story. Like, he shows up for all of four episodes, I want to say, and he's more important to the motivations of the characters than actually to the story itself. Yeah, that's that's perfectly fair to say. Who is this? So I, guess he, I guess you could say he represents things. Um, he's a guy in a suit. Right, well, we don't have a lot of those. 
I I don't have much more to go on. I have it's basically black on black for me right now. <laughs> All right. How how do I tell? Is that like a little bit of white hair there? Mhm. Mm uh who has a suit white hair? Uh, oh, whitish hair, let's say. Uh it's it's not McGillis, I think. He he looks cooler somewhere around here. No, wait. It's McGillis in his disguise, isn't it? Yep, it's a McGillis mask. I I guess at the time I didn't know if there was a difference between the two and that's where he is. It's a McGillis mask. There you go. So McGillis in his mask. Uh just straight up S tier. He's he's a, an interesting character. He's very intelligent. He has this whole plan. It goes down perfectly how he wants. He's manipulating everyone. He sets up multiple stages of false flags. He's He's great. He does it all, and I want to see him become the main antagonist, and I want to see what he has to say later on in Season 2 and how the heroes are going to actually oppose him. I want to disagree with you in that fact that he is actually is the main antagonist, so already. Uh, I, would, I would go as far to say the entire uh, Season 1 of Iron Blood Orphans. He, is he's the main villain, but he's not the antagonist as of yet because he's literally working with the main characters. He is a protagonist right now because he's pushing the plot. I would argue that no, he is in fact an antagonist just because he hasn't attacked the characters. <laughs> you gotta remember he, he, operated, he operated with Hit Fat Hitler to send our protagonists to the space pirates to get attacked. So he has also actively acted against their interests. So it's just right, because right. he hasn't himself actually attacked them does not make him not an antagonist. Right, right. I suppose that's fair. But where would you put him then? Uh, I want to put him at D tier. I fucking hate him. But I have to <laughs> agree with you that to the story, he is an S tier character. <laughs> I, I think the fact that you can actually genuinely say you hate him for reasons other than being uh, plot immune is a good sign. I think I hate him because of episode 25. I think I didn't have oh, the very, any... very end where he like betrays everyone. Well, yes. Where he reveals everything like, oh, your sister's going to be just fine. It's like, no! But no, that I love that. Of course it's the worst thing he could have said at that moment. That's why I love him. <laughs> He just ironed it in. Uh, and here we have our uh, Tewa's uh, secretary. Maribin. Uh, who joins the crew. Uh, I think she is a good, reasonable character. I I definitely like her being around. She definitely is the adult on board and has several important things to say to tell Orca to stop being such a damn teenager. Um, at the very end, she legitimately can't stop an entire wave of children trying to go to their deaths, which... To be fair, uh, yeah, I'd probably break down crying at that, too. Uh, I would put her very solidly in A tier. I uh, don't think she's, like, plot critical. Like, sh any other character maybe could have done her thing. But she does it in a way that I enjoy and like seeing. I would agree that she's A tier, but I would say that she also puts Orca on the path uh, that eventually then puts him in front of uh, his Tewa's counterpart to discuss what it means to be a leader. Because you remember, she also has to berate him for not having, like, a medic on board and everything like that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Mikazuki! So, uh, how many dates do you think he has left in his pocket? As many as he needs. So, so I think I've been leading a lot of these... I want to hear it from you first. What do you think about Mikazuki? 25 episodes in. How I mean, do you primary think? character that I don't like. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, the problem here is that he is more than a protagonist. He is one of three main characters. Which means to say that the show doesn't operate without him. And, and I hate him to such a degree that I have to question now how does our tier system work importance to the show or how much we like them i mean well, i've already broken uh kayfabe here by putting mcgillis way up an s tier despite hating him but you you could be important and do your role poorly 
It would be like having a character who's like, yes, this character is the one that everything circles around, and everything they do is complete bullshit, which is where I think you're going with Mikazuki. You know what? The problem is also that he can't do anything badly. He's an invincible fighting machine because it's the way he's written. I would argue that he's A tier. Ooh, you actually are putting him all the way up in A tier. I'm actually very surprised. Uh, because Please. I have to bow to the system that we're working with, which is importance to the story plus favoritism. I don't like him at all, but at the same time, the story only exists with him in it. But I would say he's not S tier, because I'm going to fold my hand here and say... Uh, he's who... not a good character that you like seeing ha- things happen to. Well, that too, but I would say... I'm going to, again, fold my hand here that Orga is S-tier, because Orga actually has to tell Mikazuki what to do. Mikazuki doesn't do things on his own. That's why Mikazuki would only be A-tier, whereas Orga would then have to be S-tier. You made my point for me. Mikazuki does not really have a whole lot of agency most of the time, and doesn't initiate a whole lot of stuff. The most that I think I see him have is... Either A, he's fighting people and he's making like fight decisions, which doesn't really count for much of anything, or B, he's having very short scenes where he's using his complete flat character to try to tell someone else to chill out. That's the best I think we get out of him. Aside from that, he's just a weapon. He's literally Orca's weapon. The entire metaphor, I think, for this series is the very intro stuff where it shows Mikazuki and Orca in that alley, Mikazuki has the gun, and Mikazuki is more than happy to shoot more people for Orca. That's what his character is. He is a gun. He is he is Iron Giant in reverse right here. I would put him at B tier. Well, that drags him down to B tier, then. I think there are a lot of things that you could do with Mikazuki that could make him more interesting, more likable, give him more agency. Like, at the very last episode, we were joking, what if he had an Eeyore personality? That would make him lovable right there. Just like this guy who's completely depressed, he gets all this hug, his love and affection, and he's like, alright, I guess I do like you guys. Or, or something. I- instead, like, he's just literally out for blood and doesn't care about anyone else. That that's the impression I get. He does have some small connections, but I would want to see a better Mikazuki, or none at all, uh, <laughs> or none at all. Imagine the show without him. Imagine the show where they didn't have an invincible fighter on their side. That would be pretty cool. That would be more typical Gundam, I think. Yeah, yeah. There, <laughs> there you go. All right. Next up, we have Akihiro. Akihiro. Uh he actually shows up a decent bit, I think. It, he's the other he's the other pilot. This one is the, actually the other pilot. There yep. we go. Uh I actually like him. He's got like this very um how how do I describe his character archetype? He's he's masculine Japanese archetype, I think is what I would call him, right? Uh and and like any kind of archetype like that, it could get very old, but I think he brings enough personality and charm to it that the uh, parts that could end up being like uh, very boring or uninteresting or very static, like he makes it interesting and dynamic. It is interesting to see him on screen, and it was interesting at least to see him get his characterization up against his brother, how he feels, and what was going on. Uh, naturally, like, we kind of were disappointed in the brother, but I think him going through this tragedy was something I enjoyed watching. I I would put him at least in A tier. Uh, he was described, uh, early on, before he'd seen anything, as the guts of this series. Frankly, I'm I don't see to... it. Uh... Yeah, I I think it would need to get beaten up a whole lot more for that. Well, he spends a lot of time practicing his mech, and he is the only mech with four arms, which is not really played up that much, when you think about it. I mean, like, if they went for, like, a literal direct guts reference, it's like, you can't keep up without the Alea Vignana system, and he goes, yeah, watch me, and he's, like, literally killing himself to run a mech as hard as uh, people with the Alea Vignana. I mean... 
that would make him fucking guts. Then also give him a huge ass sword for no reason too, and that would be amazing. I'm willing to go A tier. What tier did you say? A tier. Yeah. In fact, let me drag him up here. He, I would yeah, say I want, he should have been the main character. He there should have go. been the main <laughs> character, and Mikazuki should not have existed. And <laughs> I would go so far to say I would like to see Akihiro in a normal mech, not even a Gundam, going up against these fights because I think he could win in a realistic way, like, he would take a lot of damage, and they'd have to, like, repair the mech on the fly, and you'd see get battle damage along the way, and all those scenes where he's training and pushing himself to the limit would make a lot more sense. I think the yeah. show would have been better with him as the lead and no Mikazuki at all. Right. I, I think at the very least, there's the potential that this person could fail. He could lose a fight. He's lost fights before. He could die if he goes into a fight. And I think having that bit of tension very much helps as well. So right. I'm with you on all of this. Next up we have Atra. Atra, the adorable cute girl on the ship. Uh, what do we think about this one? So uh, cuteness wins my heart every time. That's for sure. And she's definitely the emotional foil here for Mikazuki. She's the one doing literally all the work to try to build this relationship with Mikazuki to make Mikazuki have some reaction other than just like complete straight faced nothing. And of all people, it's I think Mikazuki actually does have the most to say and the most reaction. Like he, he's maybe a little creepy about it because he's a psychopath, but he actually cares. But onto this character. She she does a lot of stuff. She tries to help. And I think it was very, very interesting to watch her literally say, no, I'm Kudelia, and try to trick everyone and put herself on the line like that. That was that was a great character moment. I want to give her S. I think she's amazing. Well, sadly, I want to drag her down then. No. I don't think she's worthy of S. I would put her in A tier, which means the difference that she would wind up in A tier. If I was mm -hmm. going to remake the show, I would shrink the cast down and she would be one of the main cast members because she is like the heart of a lot of the things that aren't important, which is why I, another reason why she gets dragged down. She's the heart of things that aren't important, whereas Fidelia is the heart of things she, that are important. She's the emotional core of every other character. And Biscuit, how could I how could I not put Biscuit just immediately at S? Biscuit, the character who's always there, who is one of the smartest from the outset, who has the most reasonable human personality, who has the most adorable sisters he cares about, who actually cares about his brother, is upset about what happens and everything. He, he, he's so lovable. Biscuit Biscuit is the best. I am Biscuit tempted. Is I'm tempted to drag him down to A tier. <gasps> How could you? Well, for one thing, he doesn't share a name with me. Like he does you, which I feel like <laughs> might be tinting your perspective. Also, no, no, there's no favoritism here at all. No, also, no, I'm no. tempted to do it just for how stupid his death was. He's he's on the field and gets killed on an island. That it wasn't unreasonable. He gets killed. The thing is, is that. If it's to be believed, he doesn't get killed from the uh, the force of the uh, the hit that knocks it, but uh, being pinned underneath the mech, uh, the uh, the mobile worker is what he gets hit and bleeds out. He doesn't. No, no, he doesn't. Uh, it looks like he gets hit in the back by the mobile worker, and he gets pinned under it, and then crawls his way out. My problem, the reason I find it to be stupid, is that we've seen two other characters get crushed in space inside of the cockpit of their suits and then go into critical condition and then get weaned out of it. So the show leads us to believe that these are survivable events and then kills Biscuit out of nowhere in the same condition. Uh, mm, I, I don't have a problem with this death. I think it was at least portrayed as like, yes, this this looks terrible, Biscuit dies, that's perfectly fine. And they definitely pumped up the drama of it, but I mean, they they had to. They wanted to make it significant because it was the first big death in like a long while. I mean, I'll give it to you, S-tier, because I have no strong feelings either way other than the death. I just feel like the death was 
clearly telegraphed and clearly overplayed, and it kind of sours the character for me. Right. I guess also worth mentioning, he plays a good part in Orca's own arc, where Orca has to realize, like, wait a second, wait, maybe maybe I'm uh, being a bit of an asshole. <laughs> well, once again, I find that whole thing to be forced, which is why it doesn't sit well with me, any of it. Maybe I'm being an asshole. By the way, here's a second image of my brother hanging in the doorway. <laughs> uh, this is the pig-nosed pirate captain, isn't it? Yep. Um, he doesn't do anything other than sit on the ship, does he? Uh, he negotiates the surrender. Yeah. Um, his second in command, who I can see his genes up ahead, does more than he does. All he, all Pig Nose here does is look intimidating and weird. He's literally set up to be ugly, so we hate him. I, I would put that at D tier. Well, I was gonna put him at C tier, so I guess it goes down to D tier anyway. Remember, D tier is mainly the people we don't even know. So you're saying the guy who got screen time, negotiated a surrender, and told everyone to attack is as important as the people we don't even know. Yes, because he is he is engineered only to be hated for being ugly. I mean, it's because of him that they have a uh, second ship in their little arsenal. Right, right. Which makes him plot important, but uh, can't argue with that. Uh, next up is, can you guess who? Uh, that is our commander slash love interest who I don't immediately remember the name of. Carta. Carta, there we go. Uh, I enjoyed Carta. Carta was a fun character from, like, beginning to end. She, like, had all this idea of honor. She very much cared for her people. And, like, we were almost literally rooting for her. I I would honestly put her... Where would I put her? I'll need to think on that for a second. What do you think? Well, I don't know what you mean by this almost. I was rooting for her the entire time and angry that she was being given <laughs> the foil treatment. I put her in S. Yeah, I think I would put her in S. She, along with the whole McGillis family here, it is basically like the core tragedy on the antagonist side. And it was I think they did a great job with her. Alright, next up we have the uh other main Tewaz girl, Echo. Uh I don't remember a lot of what they do in particular. I generally have a good perception of these characters, but I don't remember what specifically she does. Well, they hang out in a, a trio, so she's the one of the trio. Right, right. In in the words of another series, it's just like, ah, yes, uh, the third less memorable uh, member of your group, who I only recognize because you hang out with the other two. I would I'm put her in B tier. Pretty sure she hangs out in the bridge a lot, too. Or, or maybe even C, I don't know. I, I, I'll be nice, and with the other bridge bunnies, I'll put her at B. Oh, okay, well, she's going to C, because I put her in C. There you go, okay. Well, I mean, you put, like, the more recognizable one in B. You put the one who got the most screen time in C. So, I don't follow any logic about putting her in either of uh, them, but... Yeah, this is entirely feels based here, right? Uh... But, oh, hey, here we go, the actual pirate antagonist. The one who's, like, the real driving force and the one the characters are fighting against the whole time. Uh, don't remember his name, Kudal. but I remember him as a character. What'd you say? Kudal. Kudal. So, Kudal... The space uh, steroids guy. Is space steroids guy. He's fucking crazy. He's... He's honestly just... An enjoyable antagonist in the fact that I have no idea what the fuck he's gonna do next. I would put him at A tier just because he was he was fun to have there. He's definitely a terrible person, but I enjoyed seeing him just eat scenery. I feel like I'm gonna move him down to B tier because I feel like I would have put him at B tier with the difference between A and B puts him at B then. Because I feel like if I was going to rewrite the show, which is what I keep saying, he would have been like a secondary antagonist, which he turned out to be anyway. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I was going to put a someone like him in A tier, it would be a primary antagonist type character. 
Right. And he only really got the one fight in, so it's not like he had a long-lasting effect. Nothing he did mattered in the long run. He he was the filler antagonist, I suppose. Not even you that. Like he was the asteroids as a filler arc. Well, he was a one episode antagonist. Now there's like two or three, I think. No. It, or two. It, it got spread out a little bit. He bullied people on a ship for a while, but not those people. He bullied his own he, people on the ship. He got out yeah, in a it's... mech and fought for one episode. Right. But again, I think the reason we like him at all is that he does things. Uh, who Activity, is yeah, matters. Who is this? Masahiro? I... Masahiro. Which character was that? The name rings a bell. Well, he's either one of the ones that changed sides and joined uh, the crew, or he's actually the brother. No, no, the brother already died. That, that was you the, understand that was the there's people one. on this list that died, right? Oh. <laughs> you understand, we already did Fumitan in the first number of them, and she's dead. Actually, wait, was this, was this actually the brother? Then who was the other one? <laughs> Oh, I'm so confused. Go back over to the list that we the first two people in our S tier are dead as well. <laughs> Just in case you have some sort of confusion. Also, the last person in our S tier, the last two people in our S tier are dead. The first two people in our S tier are dead. Ah, uh, everyone dying. Oh, we love death. Well, just uh, in your comment that he couldn't be that guy because he's dead. It's very confusing to me. Okay, I mean that we already put him on the list is what I mean. Okay, so what what do you remember about this character? I already said, he's either one person or the other person. Uh, and I don't remember, so C or D tier. Well, which one are you going with? Uh, let's put it C, just so that it's in the same tier in case it's the same person. <laughs> That's fair. I was about to say D tier because we couldn't remember who it is, but if it turns out to be one or the other, then yeah, C tier makes more sense. There we go. At least at least we get one of them in there. I'll put them next this, to each this other. Is our, this is our perfect un- uh, certifiable, uh, unarguable tier list, by the way. No mistakes will be made at all. So, who do, who we do have you think here? this is? A uh, guy with a robe and a dog barking. Uh, that's not our... We, we already put the politician up there, didn't we? That's the uh, that's the Tawaz leader, then, isn't it? Whose name is... Oh, you're asking me a whole lot there. No, actually, it's just one question. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna call him Jeff. Murdoch. 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 Sorry, Murdo. Like Murdo. Oh gosh, it was Murdoch. I'd hate even more. Like Murdo. Um, I like him as a character. So he's he's a leader of a whole thing. He has a whole background plan going. He sets up the whole Dort Station thing, or like half of it. Um. I think he's got a lot of things going for him, and in the next season, we're going to see even more of him as, like, antagonist or, like, frenemy or something. He's... He actually puts a lot of stuff in the motion. He has an intelligent plan. He does everything right. Uh, and he... doesn't come across as, like, a bad character. I, I like him. I think I would put him in S tier. Well, I feel this is another jam where I'm going to be dragging him down. It's good, because you need to bring down my hopeful optimism. Well, I'm going to put him in A <laughs> tier, because he is a political motivator, mm -hmm. in that he makes a lot of uh, makes a lot of calls, right? And he negotiates with um, Kudelia, the, the you know, strength of where her actual position is, and what she's willing to do. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like he has the the strength of effect that all of our S-tier people have. Right, right. So, there we go. A-tier. Who do you think this is? Ah, oh, gosh. It's just it's just a profile with a head. Without a head. Ah, oh, gosh. Right, but you already know some of the people we've already done. And uh, you can process... kind of see who else is left. Uh, by process of elimination, he's Joe. So where does Joe go? It's he's not Joe, is he? <laughs> Again, you can kind of see who's left. Who have we not done that this I, could be? 
He, he's got to be another the bridge crew. He's actually a teenager. Technically, you're true on both accounts. <laughs> technically correct. The best kind of correct. Yeah, technically, he is on the bridge all a whole lot, and much like every other person, he is a teenager. <laughs> I don't think you uh, don't think you've correctly identified the fact that calling anybody in tech and a teenager doesn't mean anything, except for like. <laughs> two of them. There are very much, very much size differences in, like, the diff in these kids. There's the very young kids, and then there's very, obviously, the early teenagers, and then there's Orca, who's, like, the late teenager. Orca has to be, like, 15, 16, like, period. Teenager, though. There's only two people teenager. in Tekken who aren't teenagers. One's Fat Hitler he, he and the other's the 17. accountant. He is so tall, he's definitely, like, the most, he's definitely the oldest character amongst the kids, period. So who is this? Um, uh, like I said, my best guess is Joe. So where does Joe go? Uh, I have no idea who he is. He goes to D. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and put him in S tier. What? <laughs> Which I guess puts him in B tier. Because <laughs> Orga is very important to the story. Wait, that's Orga? <laughs> oh my gosh, I couldn't tell. Okay, okay. Now... Thanks for hiding it from me. <laughs> I had no idea because I just couldn't tell who the character was. Let me tell was. let me ask you this. Which of these guys did you think was Orga? I completely forgot. <laughs> I was put on the spot. I panicked. Alright. Orga is very important to the series. Orga Orga definitely is very weird to me here, right? Because on one hand, I think he's actually a a good anime protagonist, like in terms of like being this young kid doing uh weird stuff or whatever, right? I feel like he's a good main character, but also like all the criticisms we have about uh Mikazuki, we can kind of put on Orca too because he's the one pushing Mikazuki around. He's he's using Mikazuki as a weapon. He's as bloodthirsty because he's the one doing the orders. Um, I would still put him in A tier. I think he is a better character here than Mikazuki. I think he has more going for him. He goes through more. He just learn and change throughout the series. Right, Whether well. that's for good or bad, I don't know. But he's He's interesting to watch in action. That drags him down from my S tier to an A tier anyway. Uh, there you go. I feel like in my reimagined version of the show where Mikazuki doesn't exist, that Orca is still a very important character. And mm -hmm. uh, probably would be the lead telling uh, Akihiro what to do uh, in the same respect, but he would be the leader of the group as well, which is why I find him more important than Biscuit. But we put Biscuit in S tier, and apparently Orca... I guess in your version of the show, Biscuit's in charge, and Orca's not. <laughs> in my version of the show, it's Biscuit all the time. Oh, <laughs> uh, no one will watch my version of the show. Uh, next up, we have the Engineer, who, for the life of me, I can never remember the name of, but I think he comes across as one of the most sensible, intelligent characters in the series. Like, he... While while we were saying like uh our Tewa's secretary was the adult on board, he's the adult on board before the adult on board. Uh but he's kind of more distant. He's not giving parenting advice. He's like literally trying to make sure the kids do not grow up into uh complete emotional wrecks like Mikizuki. And to be fair, I don't think anyone could do anything with Mikazuki at this point. So uh, I, I would put him solidly in S tier. I think he's great. Okay, this is going to be the uh, exact opposite of the last one, because I would put him in A tier. Ooh. He is very important. He doles out a lot of important advice. Otherwise, he's very afraid of going into space, and that's where he lives now. So he's in a very unfortunate position where he's not going to actively and actionably provide any assistance, and it's not we really spend a lot of time with him repairing stuff, which is what he's doing most of the time. Right, he's an engineer. He was never going to be an action character necessarily. Right, so mainly he's very important to a lot of B-plot stuff, but not mm -hmm. actively important to the main plot stuff. Right, yeah. He's he's interacting with all of the kids, and he's trying to be supportive of them. He's the dad. 
All right. All right. Uh, I remember when we used to think that he was going to be Nobilis, that he was like the the main antagonist or something. Uh, and then it turns out he's just a cowboy. <laughs> he's cowboy S-tier. Mormon. Uh, cowboy Mormon gets S tier. Honestly, he's he wins my heart just for being so stupid. <laughs> I think uh, surprisingly is that I'm gonna have to move him down to A tier. Okay. He, despite being my favorite uh, character on the good guy side, he doesn't actually do all that much. He has a laissez-faire attitude about most of the stuff going on and does not actively participate in the vast majority of go- stuff going on. In right. fact, he- the people that we put down in B and C tier from his crew, he volunteers out to help. Otherwise, we don't see him doing all that much. Right, he's the commander role, and as such, he doesn't really do much in this series because we're following the other commander, Orca, here. So he's not important, but he's there to provide advice and help Orca grow a whole lot. I mean, I vastly prefer him to the majority. I'm sorry, when I say majority, all of Tewas. I'm sorry, Tekadin. I vastly enjoy him more than all of Tekadin, but in the <laughs> scope of doing stuff. He's not super important. <laughs> yeah. All right, so now we have pink suit or purple. I think that's Kudelia's father, isn't it? Nope. Um, Kudelia's father, I will point out, not on this list. Huh. Because he's only okay. in the very first, like, five minutes of the episode, never to be seen again. Who is he? I can name a lot of other characters. I can see Griffin's brother. Oh, in fact, never mind. I'm actually going to correct that he is on this list. Oh, okay. Uh, Damn, if he's not this one, who is he? Really? You don't know who this is? Not not based off of just the suit and profile, I'm afraid. Not even one guess. Just take it one guess. Uh, I'm trying to identify bodies in the aftermath here. It's like, sir, do you recognize this corpse? There's no face to it. But You've you know seen him person? just last episode. <sighs> Who could it be? Who could it be? How about this? You want one last biggest hint of all? Sure. You've said his name in the last minute and a half. Nobilis? Nobilis Gordon, that's him. Ah, oh, there I he is. I figured you said his name. You clearly know who he is. <laughs> I remember Nobilis the concept more than the person at this point. <laughs> um, But I do believe at the end, he's basically chilling out with Tewaz, isn't he? Yep. Yeah, so he's he's in the background. He's doing the political elements. And early on, he's supposed to be the benefactor. He, I don't think he does a whole lot, but he claims a whole lot. It's it's kind of weird. I would put him a D tier because I will want to see him take a more direct action that he can claim was legitimately his against the protagonist here. All right, I think that's going to end up putting him in C tier because I was going to put him in A tier. Ooh, A tier. He has, he's basically uh, the, God, I don't know how to put this, the Earth uh, slash Earth's uh, Gallarhorn equivalent of McMurdo. He has exactly as much authority as McMurdo has, which is why they've teamed up together. It's not that we saw him in the background, we saw them negotiating with one another, and now they have an alliance. So. Half of the plan to kill Kudelia was from Noblest Gordon. The other half was from McMurdo. So, they are exactly the same tier level of uh, affecting the story. One just did more of it in the first half, and the other did more of it in the second half. So, I was going to put them on the same tier level. So, Ah, you deciding D tier drags them down to C tier. Yeah. Uh, Out of all the political actors, I I just don't care for him a lot. He was the one that we used to see doing the uh, sauna scenes. Oh gosh! Where he kept answering. Where he kept answering the category than D. He kept answering the video phone, you know, wrapped up in the sauna. Can we put him lower than D? (laughs) Quick, add a new category. Uh, Next up is Shino. Shino, 
that name sounds familiar. I can see he's one of the teenage bridge crew for sure. Um, actually, does he end up piloting the third mech? He's the one who gets injured, isn't he? I'm pretty sure, right? Is this is correct? Do you remember? Can you collaborate? Can you, can you give me? Can you give me a little more? <laughs> you, you don't remember at all, do you? Who the hell knows? <laughs> too many people on the table side. I'm sorry, there, protected there's, inside. There's a few too many. I'm going to put him with some of the other bridge bunnies here, and he's going to go to uh, C tier. Great, which means he moves down one because I was going to put him in D tier. <laughs> there you go. All right, who's this? A, a blob. That's what he is right now for me, a blob. <laughs> Alright, well, if you had to guess, based on who's not yet done, and the colors of the blob that you see. Uh, gosh, who's left? And all the clues you've been given so far. Uh, <laughs> I'm asked to eliminate just, like, a bunch of blank tiles. It's like, well, it's not this blank tile or this blank tile. So Alright, well, here, I'll give you a clue. We talked about him a minute ago. Uh... Damn, I do not recognize that face at all. For not, very not good wizard. reason. I'll give you a major hint now. You've okay. only seen him once for like five minutes. Okay. Uh, that explains why I don't remember a single thing. Well, I literally told you you only saw this character once for only five minutes. About I'm a minute getting... ago when I told you he was on the list. Um... Wait. Uh. Wait. No. That. Oh, wait. This is Cadelia's father. Then. There it? you go. Oh. Okay. Okay. I, I keep thinking Nobilis, the bad man, the son. <laughs> this is nope. This father. is Norman. Uh, Norman All Bernstein. All I see is the sauna now. <laughs> nope. This is Norman Bernstein, father of Cadeliana Bernstein. I don't remember what he does other than at some point selling, saying that he sold his daughter off, and then we went on the whole clone theory. <laughs> yeah, he sold it to this guy in that one episode where we saw them. Yeah, it, he he appears and then disappears. He's Kudeli's got to go back to Mars and just like slap her father in the face. Honestly, he. I, I, I'm putting him in D tier. We know who he is. We know what he does. We know what he's like. But he just does not exist. Works for me. Again, we only saw him once, as far as I'm aware. All right. Orlis is next. Orlis. This was uh, second in command, wasn't it? Of who? Of uh, our female tragic lead. I don't think so. I can't be uh -huh. sure. The only facet I know is that he has five stars. Because it's on his chest, right there. Five stars. I I don't remember what he does or what point he's in the story. And we know that the best of the best have seven stars. I can only imagine he dies on the airfield, and I'm going to give him a D. Now, go with a D because we don't know who he is. I named that Pokemon. It's Baby. Oh, look at the Baby. Baby goes to C tier. I will, baby. uh... I will give you a hint. It has exactly this. He has exactly the same number of letters as uh, Baby does. That, do you have any idea how little that narrows it down? <laughs> I'll give you another hint. You saw him last episode. Well, I'm pretty sure. I, I'm pretty sure we saw all the kids last episode, but I generally think not the ones that who died. All the little, all the baby kids. Uh. So we get some like basic screen time with them, and I think the most emotional thing that happens with any of them is like one of them breaks down with our uh, adorable child lead. All right, one last major hint: he offers to tell Cookie and Cracker that Biscuit is dead. I remember that happening. I know who he. I I have a better vision of who he is, but like many of the kids. They don't. They're there as ammunition. So D tier that. I would put him as C. I would he, put him he as D tier. He is actually important. He does exist for a purpose. 
Yeah, one and joke have, at the end of the series. Also, they do, also, they, I pointed out. I think I said multiple times. I fucking hate these kids when he was on I, screen. All right. So if I were to say C, you would put him to D, and that drags him to D. There yeah. we go. Since we stopped just putting people we didn't know the names of in D, and started putting people, other people in D as well. So D yeah. is a D to me. D is D is dead to us. Uh, it's grandma. Yeah, grandma. Whatever, Grandma Griffin, I guess. Grandma Griffin, yeah, there we go. Runs the corn farm on Mars. Uh, um, I think she has a good moment standing up to McGillis when they're here investigating. Uh, and also telling Mikazuki off for being a fucking psychotic asshole. I'm giving her A tier just outright. She has very little screen time, but the little screen time she has, I think she's cool. Uh, she is in semi-important, but I don't know if she's A-tier important. <laughs> like, I don't think she holds up to the other people we've put in A-tier. Oh, oh, undoubtedly. She is not important in the slightest. She exists merely to be the guardian of Cookie and Cracker. I'm gonna say I'd put her at C-tier. So, into B. The B zone. Yeah. There we go. All right, next up is Sasi. Sasai? Sasai? Sasai. Well, his um, last name is Yankus, so let's just call him Yankus. Yankus? Excuse me? <laughs> he's one of the original mercenaries, isn't it, by the outfit? Yep. Um, I think he's the actual and then charge, and not the one you said before. The, the, the actual actual, and not just the asshole who bullies the kids. Uh, right. He gets shot. I think he's also a bit of a jerk. I... I don't remember anything about him. His compatriot was kind of more memorable. I would just straight give him C. Ah, uh, sure. That works for me. It's okay. They they appear for one episode, and then they're gone. Uh, what's this guy's hey, name? It's Biscuit's brother. That's his name. Biscuit's brother. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember the name, but I do remember what he does and what he's like. And, um... Uh, I got things to say about, like, being this negotiator and stuff, but if we're just gonna keep the character, like, uh... I think... Uh, so he's definitely, like, a... He's definitely weak, and he, like, gives up very easily, and he, he suicides himself at the end, which is terrible, but, um... I think he's a good character for the purpose he serves. He's there to kind of be this emotional antagonist for Griffin to try to overcome so that uh, Griffin can be more confident in their choices afterwards. So he kind of overcomes his brother after like his love for his brother is rebuked. I think... I think I would give him an S tier character. He doesn't have a lot of time to build up, but in the time he does, he gets a lot done and is kind of the focal point for a whole lot of stuff, and he does it well. He even almost succeeds until he doesn't realize who Cadelia is. <laughs> well, one, his name is Saverin. Saverin. Uh, two, man. are you saying he gives up easily because he killed himself? Um. At other points, he just kind of starts begging to get his way. That's not giving up. In fact, the effort of begging to get your way is effort. <laughs> uh, pointedly, you might remember that he got onto the other side of the fence and was talking to Biscuit face-to-face -face when the Gallarhorn soldiers were still trying to shoot through the fence. Yeah. The one time Tekadid is right in its aggression is where this union needs to do something so that it can actually force an agreement out, and he's like, no, no, let's negotiate it. Uh, that's a bad move in general, but that doesn't make him a bad character here. He was I, interesting to watch. He is an antagonist. I think if you're putting him in S, then I'm dragging him down to A tier. Okay. Uh, I don't actually think he was all that important, other than the fact he caused Biscuit's death, indirectly. Mm -hmm. I feel like if Biscuit didn't get the message, the suicide note from him that Biscuit wouldn't have gone on the tear that he went on that eventually put him into a position that he got killed in. 
So I think he's important to the plot in so much that indirectly I feel like he caused the events that he, led to Biscuit's death. He was part of Biscuit's character, yes. And otherwise, I felt like he was right in most things. So, <laughs> Despite you saying that he was wrong in most things, I thought he was on the right side, both emotionally right, right. and thought process. Yeah, but like that's not what this tier is. It's, it's how entertaining it was. <laughs> well, I mean, that's also not what this tier is, so... So who who knows what this tier list is now? <laughs> yeah, it's basically uh, where we think people should go. Name this Pokemon. Uh, D tier, isn't it? <laughs> That's where you're gonna put them. <laughs> uh, that is Takaki. Uh, and then here we have it: the man of the hour, the, the myth, one who's been haunting legend. my nightmares since the original bit of the series. It's it's your favorite. It's my nightmare. It's Fat Hitler. <laughs> A guy you thought we got rid of a long time ago and shows and he up. he just keeps coming back. <laughs> shows up in the very last episode as well, calling himself the right hand of McGillis, amongst other episodes he's shown back up for. Also, other episodes, McGillis himself said, the mustache guy kept telling me all this information. <laughs> oh, the mustache guy, Theta, right. That's what his name is. <laughs> well, apparently, it turned, as it turns out, that it was Toto, the right hand of McGillis. Fat right. Hitler from the beginning. So I would not have liked Toto nearly as much if you didn't hack on this whole Fat Hitler thing and we caused this whole spat. But even so, I think looking at him like very, uh, very critically, he is a fun character. He is the sleazy antagonist who just does not die, does not... Uh, does not give up. He keeps trying to do everything he can to be the worst person he can be, and he's just fun to watch. He is... I want to see him fail more, just because it's hilarious. I love... I love Toto. Give him an S tier. <laughs> he is as important to the star as Kudelia. <laughs> I'm gonna drag him down from your S tier ranking. Despite being my <laughs> joke favorite from episode 1, I think he is A tier, though. He lives... <laughs> Uh, I think he's A tier though, because apparently, remember, he's the one that influences the the pirates to get a, uh, to attack the the main characters. He mm -hmm. sells them out information wise before that happens, before he gets shipped off to Gallarhorn. He, he winds gets up a as, lot of things done. He winds up as McGillis's right hand man, uh, both before he says it in the right last episode and the episodes before where you see him just hanging out on the bridge of McGillis's ship. Apparently, yeah. McGillis sees in him something that he wants in the future. I he gotta say, for a flunky, so most of the time, flunkies are completely ineffective and worthless and have no point. They're, they're there just for, like, the main antagonist to show how evil they are when they berate their flunky who's constantly failing. But this man actually gets stuff done. McGillis killed his Toto best friend. Toto is actually useful. McGillis killed his best friend. Toto is still here. Baffling, for sure. <laughs> and lastly, we have... The last Pokemon of all. Guess where he's going. You got me. <laughs> he goes, yeah, with the other kids. Uh, they, they deserve a little bit better, but that's just what they get right now. All right, that's our ranking. An S tier filled with mostly Galarhorn people. Yep. Oh, gosh. And Biscuit and Kudelia still are absolute favorites. Most of the cast did get into A and B tier, at the very least. Uh, and all the C tier are, like, minor characters who didn't have a lot going on. Except for this one, who you just didn't remember was very important. Uh, I will still claim they didn't have a lot going on for them. Which is why like they're in said, C tier. Yeah. They're, that's why they're in C tier. Even Grandma, better than no, <laughs> than no Billis. Poor no us. So there we have it. That is our official Season 1 Iron Blood Orphan tier list for the characters. Uh, and did we want to do episodes right now or another one? Uh, we'll do it right now. We'll wrap it up into the same. All right. Let's do some quick episodes then. So I got my list and you got your list. Your list is actually in an order. How about you give me yours? Uh, no, I think we said we you would give us yours first, because you liked more of these than I did. Okay. So I'm the one who went are... on mad tirades. You had of appreciation for the show, so give me your number one. Actually, no, start the opposite. Give me your number five. 
Uh, that's the thing. I don't know what order I would put these in, but let's start with the earliest episode. Damn it, Griffin, I gave you five minutes. So I had five minutes and I still failed. Uh, trust me, it's not going to... You'll have a better order than I will. Five, I never five. Okay, if you ordering. if you have but no I can order, say I like all these episodes. If you have no order at all, then yeah, let's go with mine then, and then you can indicate to me if any of these made your list. All right. So, what's your what's the lowest worst of your favorites? My uh, fit number five. My uh, I'm gonna say least favorite. I get least favorite of my favorites, which sounds weird saying out loud. I know. That's funny. Is uh, episode number one, Iron and Blood. Oh, really? Episode one? It's where we first get to meet Crank and see his ideals and everything he stands for. It's also the episode where we see the main characters in their worst position. And it should be the episode that gets us to see the plight of the main characters and uh, empathize with them and want to see them succeed. It kind of fails doing that, mind you, which is why I said it was a failing of the show. But it's all, uh, I can't remember, I believe they also, uh, that's the episode that Gallahorn first attacks, we see the deaths of main, um, uh, not main characters, the deaths of, uh, the orphans in the mobile workers. It's the, basically the intro to the entire thing, but it's also, right. when we were making the list, I said, yeah, I have to throw this one in there somewhere, because Crank is only in two episodes, <laughs> I have to not be the episode he dies in. So that's, that's why funny I... because one of mine is the one where he dies. So. <laughs> uh, but talking about the first episode, I think you're right. I think it is a good episode for the sake of, like you said, it's where the characters are at the lowest, and we are literally rooting for them to succeed. Well, again, I feel like the episode failed in its uh, in its need to have us uh, root for them more. It doesn't really put them into the position where I feel like uh, like an, uh, an anime like now and then here and there where we really feel like my god these the people the, the people in these positions are in a horrible place I really want them to succeed because I really don't want to see anybody in this position whereas these war torn orphans are basically like the bad place we see them in is no worse than a, minor, a middle manager position. Like, oh god, we have to stand in front of our boss and listen to him give us orders. Right. Alright, so that was that was your number five. I'm going to go ahead and just to, to put out one of mine as we're going. Like I said, one of mine is Glorious Demise, the episode where Crank dies. I think that was a very interesting episode. It does go more into depth about, like, Gallerhorn, how it functions, why Crank is doing this, and I think it is actually an interesting kind of emotional point of the series. And it is for both uh, our protagonist and antagonist here, who is Crank at that time, because the protagonist also need to lift this weight off of them if they're going to do this whole Kudelia thing. And so this is them trying to get free from that and get some breathing room so they can actually go to space and do the whole rest of the series, basically. A lot of stuff relies on this episode to be a good one, and I think it does put enough motive into the rest of the series to get it going. It wraps up basically everything that happens on the surface of Mars. Unfortunately for me, it didn't make the list because it starts my divergent path into not liking the protagonists. Namely, in this episode, uh, Mikazuki does the whole crank gives the speech, starts giving a speech about why what they're doing is good and how he couldn't face uh, himself to uh, face a child in battle and Mikazuki just kills him mid-sentence and does the whole shut-up thing where he doesn't yeah. care about what's going on around him. Or the um, intents or motivations of the Gallarhorn soldiers. It was the start of the divergence where I started hating the main characters, so it would never have made my list. Right, right. So, what's your number four? Uh, my number four is episode 16, Fumitan Admos. Ooh, okay. So, why is this one one of your favorites? Uh, it gives us the uh, mindset of Fumitan. Uh, leading up to her obvious death. Um, and it gives us uh, more than we'd ever seen from her character before, and I felt like it was also a position I could get behind. God, I hate this rich girl. I wish you could see the world as it really was. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna make her suffer for a little bit, and then she you know shoves her off basically to get lost to a bunch of homeless people who she basically treats in that way that you see in like bad Mexican films. Like I'm gonna give you a dollar, and oh my god, all these kids are here, they all want a dollar, <laughs> and then she feels bad when uh, Kudeli, who only wants to do good, is then surrounded and scared and trying to search. She's basically like a puppy that gets smacked in the newspaper for doing something bad and then cowers under your feet because you're the person mm-hmm. supposed to be protecting them. I felt it gave us a, ver- a lot of various angles on the character we didn't get to see very much from the episode before they die. Right, yeah. And, and I definitely I would agree. I think Fumaton's episode here, uh, it was definitely a very interesting one. It gave us a lot and it definitely had to pull all the lead work to make us care about Fumaton as she's dying and it succeeded. It did well. Uh, and in that light, I think well, one of my favorites here is literally the episode directly afterwards where the consequences of that play out. Where, let's see, let, what does this say over here? Uh, following the massacre, uh, or you want to give us the name of the episode real quick? Yeah, Kudelia's decision, there number seventeen. Uh, so I like that one just because it does continue on with that. Kudelia takes this and eventually comes to say, like, wait, I actually really have to do this thing. People actually have to uh, hear me speak, and I have to make them believe in something. Uh, and she decides, quote, not only to fight for Mars, but the colonies as well. So she broadens her her scope of her mission. It's very she... funny. It's very funny. It's not one that makes my list. It's very funny though, and I'll tell you why. Two from now. Oh, oh! It's also. I believe this is also the one where they figure out that all their mechs do not work, and they get completely plunked by it. Yeah, it's very. That was funny. hilarious. I love that just because it was it was a great payoff to it all. And I think we even suggested earlier on, like, what if they just sabotaged all of that? Yeah, why would you give them working stuff? But yeah, no, it was funny. So so that made my list. So what's your number three here? My number three was episode 25, Tekken. It was a, despite everything that I hated in it, like all of my favorite characters meeting their end, like all my <laughs> remaining favorite characters meeting their end, and literally playing out the way I fully expected it to. It was one of the more action-packed uh, episodes where a lot of uh, action was happening besides non-action as well. And uh, I guess the fact that it played out the way I expected it to, where my expectations were, if I was a good writer, this is what I would do. Uh, and not, not the, God, why the fuck does this keep happening kind of episode. So, this was the the most expected episode, which is why it made my number three the halfway point of my uh, favorites list. Uh, this one is also on my favorite list. I very much like the finale here. I think it had, like you said, a lot of action, a lot of good points. It had, like, the culmination of all the drama. It was, it was good. I enjoyed it, and I can see why other people say these are their two favorite episodes. I thought it made both of our lists. Okay, well, here's the funny one. Uh, you put number 17 on your list? Yes, I did. Well, you might remember 17 is the one that blue-balled us with uh, yes. a speech that never started. Yes, I do. I also find that hilarious, but the character moments were still good. Well, Wait. this is the thing. <laughs> number uh, My number two is episode number 18, Voice, where we fucking get the speech. <laughs> I'm not going to put the... Ep- care about the content of it. I, I don't care fair. about the one that blue-balls us into us starting to take an action. You know what? She starts taking action in 17. She fucking does the action in 18. And she starts talking. And she starts using her diplomatic prowess to, like, I'm going to stand in front of this fleet of ships and use my words to end this combat. And not these. And she succeeds. And not these three invincible fighting assholes <laughs> standing on top of the ship. Right, that's what I'm mm-hmm. saying. That's why voice stands out to me and not Kudelia's decision. Kudelia's decision was a blue ball episode. <laughs> Number 18 was the payoff. I'm going to go with the payoff episode and not the one yeah, that, that's... that you know, cliffhangs us. Yeah, that's perfectly fair, honestly, and I, I can agree. It Honestly, I think the Dort arc is probably one of my favorite arcs in the series, as a general case. 
Uh, probably just because it has a very finite scope, and we very much understand what people are about during the whole conflict. Oh, was that it, Griffin likes the episodes that rise up against capitalism? Who would have guessed? Who could have guessed? Ah, yeah. <laughs> All right, what's another one on your list? Uh, so let's see. Uh, here's one. Uh, the other finale episode, number 24, A Future Reward. I believe that sets up and gives us what we've kind of been asking for all along, right? Which is like this horror of wars, these children are being injured and suffering, but they have to keep on fighting kind of thing. I think the entire attitude of that episode was great. And I think just the way everyone is weary, how they weren't necessarily winning, how they had to like endure and try, uh, definitely won me a whole lot of points. It felt like a desperate position, and I was invested in seeing how this would turn out. Well, as it turns out, this is where we're going to double up again, so the last episode is going to be yours to say, because my number one is episode 24, A Future Reward, which I believe I said at the very end, this was everything I wanted the show to be about from the very beginning, and we only got it in a single episode, which is A Future Reward. We get people paying the price for uh, military decisions, we saw non-simple advancements where people were dying for just trying to do simple things. We mm -hmm. saw the Gundam unable to act in a uh, frontline uh, uh, position, which meant that despite how all the invincibility that Mikazaki was given from the get-go, he could not do anything to stop things from happening. Mm -hmm. It very much eliminated my problem with the show and uh, exemplified everything I wish the show had been from the start. So the fact we only got it in a single episode makes it my favorite episode of the show. Just wait until season two is just all that all the time, and we get everything we ever wanted. Or, you know, <clears throat> the mercenaries fighting red tape. All right. They're so starting to do so their uh, academic homework, which means they're going to be able to learn to read and write, which means they're going to be able to fight the bureaucracy. Oh, okay. <laughs> the bureaucracy horrors. Children, soldiers, and bureaucracy, how could you? It's going to be uh, a time jump to them graduating college. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Iron-blooded orphan college graduates. <laughs> Alright, but yeah, you've got your last one on your list. And yeah, not so in any was... given order. Alright, so not in any given order. The last one on my list here is To the Place of Return, the episode Biscuit Dies. <laughs> Where where they start off with the fight, I believe, uh, they go through all the different things that are happening there. Uh, but also a big part of that episode, I believe, was actually Biscuit revealing to Orca he wants to leave, going through the argument, getting the reconciliation. And then at the end, he dies tragically. Orca and Biscuit build up their friendship, reaffirm it once again, their best buds to the end, their duo commanders, and then Biscuit dies and Orca's all alone. It is terribly tragic. Mikazuki is the only other real friend I think Orca has, and we know how terrible of a friend Mikazuki is. He's a literal wall. What do you do with him? He, he's more of a little brother, I would say, in concept, right? Biscuit seemed like an actual friend and peer who's, like, going through the same journey, who cares a lot about Orca, and Orca seems to care about Griffin and his opinion, even if, you know, occasionally he kind of ignores it. <laughs> but they're both there from the beginning, they're constantly dealing with each other, they're, they are friends, and Orca loses the one peer he actually has. See, my problem with that episode was that it was an emotional jerk-off episode in that they're just foreshadowing the events that are about to happen. And that was the previous one, 20. No, they both were, because it does the same thing. Mikazuki has his own flashback to uh, Biscuit uh, before he walks off. Remember, in the very beginning of the episode, oh, Mikazuki right, right. shows... They, just... they do... Yeah. They, they, they retread the emotional things from before while foreshadowing that Biscuit's probably going to be dead by the end of this episode. Yeah, tw so, 20 was all the build-up, 21 was the, the payoff for the death. But again, it wasn't payoff. It was, for me, again, it was just an emotional jerk-off, like, ho, 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 all these characters we don't like, oh, yeah, you're really gonna cry! <laughs> no, I think I'm gonna pass. For me, that was just a bunch of nothing episodes. 
Uh, I I do think that I enjoyed it. I think uh, it was so the entire time we were complaining, it's like, oh, no one dies. Oh, they're invisible. And then Biscuit, my favorite from like near the beginning, gone. Let's see. Uh, I had already lost Crank by that point. Carter, the next episode. <laughs> yeah, you've lost so many people yeah. along the way. <laughs> I guess but technically was... we thought maybe Toto was gone as well. There are many point. flowers out there, but this one was mine. Yeah. He was Griffin. I'm dead. Goodbye, world. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't think Biscuit holds a candle to uh, Crank, so... Uh, mm, mm, imagine a world. Right? I, I put them on the same tier. They're both good, important, fun characters. Right. I'm just saying. Imagine a world where in episode two, an accident happens and Biscuit dies, and Crank joins the crew as some sort of. <laughs> I'm going to teach you kids how to fight, and I'm going to teach you guys how to survive in a world not designed for you to survive in. Imagine a world where Crank was in Biscuit's position, teaching these kids how to live the right way. We we gotta save that for the Iron Blood and Orphan visual novel. The fan fiction that we write between the ourselves. <laughs> so there we have it, then. So those are uh, our favorite characters, our favorite episodes, and, of course, uh, more of a bitch and moaning. So, uh... Theta, you got anything you want to lead off on, or should I just go ahead and close this out? Well, I mean, that was our uh, wrap-up for basically Season 1, so... So then to wrap up the wrap-up, this has been Stone-Faced Reactions. I'm Griffin, that's Theta. Thank you all for joining us, and catch us next season. Until next time, everyone. See ya. Hey everybody, thanks for watching another Stone-Faced Reactions. If you have an idea of another video we could go ahead and watch, go ahead and put it in the comments down below, and we'll add it to the wheel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let us know what you thought about this video, what parts you liked. And until then, we'll see you next time. Is this too goofy?